The inspiration for my engine build was the uh, Kenner B-5 airplane built during the 1940s as a military trainer. I chose this for its simplicity, being a five-cylinder radial engine that employed individual camshafts per cylinder. I did some research on the internet and found the Wikipedia page that had the engine specifications which gave me the bore and stroke which I would be able to use to develop a one-third scale model of the engine. Over the two years of the build I was able to find some uh, original Kinner literature which I found quite interesting. I was able to compare how the Kinner was built to, uh, to my design. To begin the design, I needed a piston that was about one-third the size of the Kinner piston. I chose a still chainsaw engine piston, 42 millimeters in diameter, and I based the cylinder dimensions to get a proportionate stroke. The camshafts, believe it or not, come from Briggs & Stratton lawnmower engines. I measured the lift and duration of the lobes of each camshaft to ensure they were consistent and while doing so I found that the uh, camshafts had an extended uh, intake lift duration which is actually a built-in compression release. In order to have maximum compression I got rid of this by milling off the excess lift on each camshaft. I selected valves from a 70cc moped motor. They were the largest valves I could fit in the diameter of the cylinder and I made my own uh, brass valve guides. Using the valve assembly and guides, I developed the overall design of the valves, including the valve seats. I machined seats out of uh, free machining steel. And then I built a prototype of the valve train to verify that the uh, system would work and that the valves would actually fit in the cylinder without uh, clearance problems. For my design I elected to go with an exposed valve train both for the retro look and for simplicity of design and execution. the cylinder and the heads designed, I was able to further develop the configuration of the engine, uh, placement of the components, which would determine the crankshaft and also the connecting rod. The connecting rod is the typical master and link rod connecting rod where the master rod uh, rotates around the crankshaft and the link rods follow. Next I cut out a rough blank of the master rod using a template and develop some fixturing to uh, make the master and link rods. This is the master rod partially roughed out and the fixture. I finished machining the master rod on a rotor table in the mill. These are the master and link rods in their nearly finished state. It's interesting to see that the master rod went from just over 33 ounces to a little over 8 ounces in its final state. This is the fixture used to make the link rods.
Internal combustion is not rocket science. If you have compression, spark, and an air fuel mixture, you'll have internal combustion. This section deals with the internal components that will provide compression. I finalized the cylinder design and then began fabrication using blanks cut from a solid bar of cast iron. Next I turned the internal diameter to just under the required size and then machined in the cooling fins using a parting tool. These are the cylinders in their nearly final state. I made six cylinders so I'd have one spare. This is the cylinder in its final state. You can see the bore has been uh, honed to its final diameter on the mill. Next come the cylinder heads, all of which were machined from a solid bar of aircraft grade aluminum. And as with the cylinders, I made an extra cylinder head. It's much easier to make them when the tooling is all set up, so I thought I'd have a spare. It's interesting to note that the cylinders went from just over seven pounds to a finished product of just over three pounds. The next challenge was to place the spark plug in the cylinder head so that it missed the intake and exhaust ports and missed the mounting bolt holes. And then I made a wooden mock-up of the cylinder head so that I can test the placement. And then I made this fixture to hold the cylinder heads at exactly 45 degrees and to get repeatability. To complete the crankshaft design, I had to determine the weight of the counterbalance. I found this white paper online about how to balance a Kinner B5 engine. It looks complicated, but essentially the uh, counterbalance weight is equal to the rotating weight plus about 50% of the reciprocating weight. To determine the reciprocating and rotating weight, I weighed each piston and connecting rod assembly and then charted them. Using this data, I developed the dimensions of the required counterweight and then designed the counterweight to match these dimensions. And then to complete the crankshaft design, I designed the propeller hub so I could determine the output shaft dimensions. And then to finish the prop hub, I drilled the mounting bolt holes on a CNC vertical mill to get uh, bolt hole accuracy within five ten thousandths of an inch to eliminate any source of vibration. With the crankshaft dimensions now determined, I was able to complete the design of the crankcase section. I added keyways to locate the crankshaft webs onto the crankshaft and then machined the webs out of one inch steel stock. To test the balance of the crankshaft, I made a weight representing the reciprocating and rotating weight and put it on the crankshaft and then put it between centers on the lathe and spun it repeatedly and adjusted the um, counterbalance weights until it was perfectly balanced. 
This is also a great opportunity to add the connecting rod piston and cylinder to verify the stroke was right and more importantly to verify that the connecting rod would clear the cylinder opening as the crankshaft rotated. Next I completed the valve gear train design and then I mocked it up to uh, verify that it would work. With these components now placed I'm able to complete the overall engine design and complete the crank case design. It's critical that the five-sided crankcase be a regular pentagon so that everything lines up perfectly and this is the formula to do just that. I marked up the pentagon in wood to test the math. And then I began laying out all the components in the drawing to get their locations. And then I use this dimension drawing to lay out all the components on the mock-up to verify that everything would fit as anticipated. With this done, I completed the design of the front and rear crank case panels and located all the components on the panels. And then I finished the design of the crank case side panel. I made this fixture to hold the side panels at a precise angle so I can machine them accurately. And along the way I realized I was going to need an engine stand to assemble this thing. For ignition I needed a 5 cylinder distributor. I used components I was familiar with. A uh, points and condenser from a 1965 Triumph Spitfire, a uh, distrib distributor rotor from a 1964 Toyota Corona, The ignition coil and ignition wires are for a 1968 Buick LeSabre. For carburation, I chose the carburetor from a stationary Honda engine. They're simple and reliable. In order to begin the final assembly I needed head gaskets and copper is the ideal material to stand up to the extreme pressure and temperature but it's extremely hard to machine because it's very gummy. I came across this method of making a sandwich and boring the internal diameter and turning the outside diameter. It took a full day but I came away with about a dozen perfectly formed head gaskets. And these are the camshaft timing gears with number four cylinder and timing. And since this is an airplane engine, of course the prop hub nut is safety wired onto the crankshaft.
And here we're establishing top dead center and putting timing marks on the prop hub. And during final assembly, I check the timing of each camshaft. So after two years of research, design, machining, and assembly, we run the engine. Or, hey, I'll try no joke. Okay. Ignition. Ignition. Contact. Okay, the ignition's on. Good. Oh, God. I'm still printing this. You had to screw with it, did you? <laughs>